So very well, uh, warm. welcome to Back to Bodies uh, Q2 update, and thanks to the ARC team just today. It's a pleasure to be back uh, again with a real live audience uh, here since we're in front of, of big pleasure for us. Also, thanks to the people listening in to, to today uh, as, as we provide the highlights of the second quarter. With me today, I, I'm Michael Engsi, I'm the CEO of, of Vaxibody. With me today, uh, we have our Nede Fredriksen, co-founder and chief innovation and strategy officer. And we have Harald Gurvin, our CFO. Harald is recently new to the team uh, and brings a strong and long track record within financial as a CFO, but also a very relevant experience with the US capital market, which of course is highly interesting to us at this moment. Note on our forward-looking statements, and I assume you're familiar with those, so on that assumption we'll move forward. It's been a while since we were uh, here together, so we thought we would provide you with a bit of extra update and insight into our projects, and in particular, the exciting collaboration we have with Adaptive on the next generation COP2 vaccines, and uh, our lady will take you through that one, and our uh, Hal will take you through the financials, and I'll provide a brief update on the organizational development. For those that are new to Active Body, uh, briefly, Active Body is a clinical stage uh, immunotherapy company entirely devoted to exploiting and leveraging our unique proprietary and leading vaccine technology, uh, which allows us to address a broad range of diseases. And the unique aspect of our technology is our ability to bring the antigens to the antigen presenting cells. So if there's one key message we'd like you to take home about our technology, it's our ability to bring the antigens to the antigen presenting cells. And our leader will talk more about that, but that does give us a ability to generate a uniquely rapid, strong and long lasting immune response. We have a highly advanced uh, oncology pipeline with two uh, phase two assets, VB10 Neo, our fully individualized Neo uh, antigen cancer vaccine, uh, which we're currently investing against a, a broad range of tumor types, and VB1016, which is our off-the-shelf cancer vaccine uh, targeted against HPV-driven cancer types, uh, and therefore also with a broad uh, unmet need. We, back in October last year, announced a significant landmark collaboration with Genentech, which in addition to partnering us up with a partner of choice, also provided a significant cash uh, position with 200 million US dollars in upfront and near term, uh, additional potential 500 million, 515 million US dollars in milestones, and a low double digit royalties on sales. We're also uh, investing in advancing our infectious disease uh, area, and we recently announced that we're taking our next generation COVID vaccine candidates into a clinic on the other side of summer. We'll be telling you more about that one. And we, in early July, uh, reported or announced the also groundbreaking collaboration with another partner of choice, Adaptive Biotechnologies, to generate a novel T cell uh, based cancer vaccine. Uh, sorry, uh, COP2 vaccine. Vaccine Body has a crystal clear vision. We want to become the world's leading vaccine technology company. I do believe our technology provides the perfect basis for achieving that vision. We have a three pillar strategy that will take us there. First, we will invest significantly in taking our assets, our current assets, to development closer uh, and hopefully in the end onto the market. But at the same time, we will invest significantly in further leveraging our technology platform, which will fuel future pipeline expansion, but also take us into new therapeutic areas. And we, uh, in the spring, announced that we've begun the first research on uh, exploring the technology's potential in the area of autoimmune disease, which is also a significant uh, area with, with a huge unmet medical need. We'll continue to employ uh, an aggressive partnering strategy to complement our strength, and this will be partnerships like the one you've seen with Genentech, but also partnerships in the more early stage uh, part of development with uh, companies that, that will accelerate the development of our projects, and Adaptive is an example of that one. Look at the pipeline, uh, and here I just want to emphasize that we continue to invest heavily in research, uh, both within the off-the-shelf cancer vaccines as well as in the infectious disease areas, to ensure we have a continuous flow of new projects coming into the development. 
And with those words, I'll hand over to Aunea to take us through the technology and an update on the project. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, so um, briefly, as a repetition for most of you, I hope, <laughs> uh, tell you a bit about the Vaxibody platform technology. It was really developed based on this concept of targeting the antigens to antigen presenting cells in order to create more efficacious vaccines, because we all know that these antigens need to be processed by the specific cell type in order to initiate an antigen specific immune response, both antibody as well as T cell responses. This is important. So what we've done is to create this a molecule that is unique to Vaxibody, where we have combined a targeting unit that can in principle be any molecule that binds to surface receptors on antigen presenting cells. So even though our clinical products so far is focusing on one chemokine in the targeting unit, our technology is broad and we can explore multiple different targeting units that will lead to different immune response profiles. In the dimerization unit is derived from human immunoglobulins and making sure that its molecule forms as a dimer, which is important for all the downstream processes. Uh, and then at the um, uh, C-terminal end of this molecule, we can incorporate any antigen. And already from the products we have in the clinic so far, uh, it's easy to see that we can incorporate large globular antigens, multiple uh, large globular antigens, for induction both of antibody responses and T-cell responses, uh, as well as a large set of T-cell epitopes that we can select from uh, the uh, disease of choice. Our IP uh, covers this molecule that consists of these three combined and interchangeable functional uh, units, irrespective of the delivery format. So our clinical products now are uh, really um, developed based on the naked DNA plasmid for, um, formulation. So um, simply formulated in TBS and filled into glass vials, uh, which makes the, the manufacturing process and the cost of goods extremely um, beneficial. Uh, but we can also um, uh, encode these molecules as mRNA vaccines if we want it in viral vectors, as well as purify them and deliver them as protein-based vaccines. This uh, uh, platform technology is applicable to develop specific and optimized vaccine products, both within the field of cancer, infectious diseases, and as uh, Michael alluded to, uh, interestingly, potential uh, also in autoimmune. So um, the mechanism of action, as I said, uh, at the moment we formulate these as naked DNA plasmid, uh, simply formulated in PBS and filled into glass vials. Um, and they are delivered with this uh, uh, simple uh, needle-free jet injector that makes sure that the DNA plasmid enters through the skin into the muscle. And then these cells start to produce the vaxibody protein. And at that stage, that's where the unique features of our technology starts uh, as being a differentiated from other vaccine technologies. So um, what happens initially, particularly with these molecules that I mentioned having a chemokine in the targeting unit, that induces chemotaxis locally, which is their natural function actually to attract these antigen presenting cells to the site of injection. Uh, and then um, importantly, since these are um, homodimers, they will bind to two neighboring chemokine receptors on the surface of these antigen presenting cells which is their natural threshold to understand now I am at the site where there is inflammation and I need to be activated because it mimics that you have a high local concentration of these chemokines, which you should have when you have inflammation. So that means that um, we trigger the downstream processes as effectively as possible by triggering these two chemokine receptors as neighboring uh, receptors. What happens in 3B, which we have focused on uh, mostly important for our cancer products so far, uh, but we also see obviously with the, with the COVID products is uh, for induction of T cell responses. Once this molecule is internalized, um, it is taken up uh, by these antigen presenting cells and importantly uh, channeled both through the classical pathway, 
um, which means that it will be presented on MHC class two molecules in, and trigger CD4 T cell responses, helper T cell responses, which is the easy and natural way for vaccines, uh, which most vaccines can effectively achieve. Uh, but importantly, when we trigger these specific hemokine receptors, we optimize the likelihood of the molecule being channeled also through the cross presentation pathway, which is the tricky part uh, where the epitopes will be loaded onto MHC class one molecules and induce CDI T cell responses. And this is where we have seen that we have a much better potential to induce broad CDI T cell responses than all non-targeted vaccine technologies, which is also what Genentech and now also Adaptive Biotechnologies mentions as one of the key reasons for choosing Vaxibody as their partner. When it comes to antibody responses, um, uh, we haven't focused that much uh, internally uh, before on the induction of antibody responses. But if you look here in 3A, the vaccine body molecule actually has a very interesting feature for um, in induction of antibody responses as well. So when the uh, vaccine body uh, targeting unit binds to the surface receptor on antigen presenting cells before the molecule is internalized, it's basically coating this antigen presenting cell. So um, we see the antigenic unit, which is at the other end of the molecule, is really coating the antigen presenting cell, and it's very readily available for recognition by these B cell receptors, which is the antibody molecule in the surface of the B cells. That creates this ATC B cell synapse, which is basically bridged by the vaccine body protein and is a known immunological uh, feature in order to induce strong and rapid and high affinity antibody responses and probably explains why we see um, these uh, rapid antibody responses in our uh, preclinical studies so far. Um, Vaxibody as a company, in addition to uh, having this targeted, unique uh, three modular technology, we have invested over the last years a lot in uh, bioinformatics in order to select the optimal antigens to incorporate into the antigenic unit, which is also important. And obviously we had to invest in that when we uh, developed our VB10 Neo products, where we are predicting which epitopes that we should incorporate into each patient's vaccine uh, in order to uh, identify those that have the highest potential to induce a strong and relevant uh, T cell response. That product and that uh, feature is now in principle out licensed to Genentech, but we have learned a lot through that development over the years and that knowledge we can now take advantage of when we develop and select epitopes for our shared cancer antigen vaccines as well as for our infectious disease vaccines. These are really magicians, these bioinformatics. You can, you can ask them everything and suddenly <laughs> you get an answer within two minutes. So um, we'll briefly just repeat um, here with vb This is our fully individualized new antigen based cancer vaccine uh, program. Um, as mentioned last year, we finalized enrollment in this first study that we have um, uh, performed ourselves. Uh, that was with five different cancer indications and up to 50 patients. And then as of October last year, we announced that we were able to attract uh, uh, this landmark care partnership with uh, Genentech. Uh, and as mentioned by Michael, uh, also gives us, uh, in addition to the validation and to having a partner that helps us take this program forward as optimal as possible, uh, it also provides us with significant cash uh, in order to uh, uh, continue develop uh, the company. Uh, as of this summer, we announced that we initiated this next study that we call VBNO2. Uh, that is performed in extremely tight collaboration with the Genentech team. Uh, we are officially the sponsor, but we are working extremely tightly with Genentech on that. Uh, we are expanding the number of indications in that study. So it's um, 
or 10 different uh, potential indicated or 10 indications. Um, we are testing here two doses. So this is really the big pharma way of making sure that we do not miss out on any potential uh, upside in the products before launching this broadly uh, in, the, um, in the large studies uh, towards the market. Um, so this is a doubling uh, of the dose we tested in NO1. And this is also then obviously um, performed in uh, combination with atezolizumab, which is uh, Genentech Roche um, anti pdl one antibody. Uh, it's also uh, up to 40 patients in this study. Um, in the NO1 uh, for new antigens, we have uh, demonstrated an ability to raise board, uh, mentioned also with the mechanism of action, and strong patient uh, by patient new antigen uh, specific immune responses also shown uh, here to the right. Um, we interestingly as a scientist uh, is uh, um, very intriguing to see that we did have correlation between the vaccine induced immune responses and these signs of clinical responses that we observed and, and published for the first 14 patients um, where we had patients that were stable disease uh, that um, on checkpoint inhibitors that started to uh, respond and have reduction in lesions after starting vaccination and also patients that were uh, re progressive disease um, on checkpoint inhibitors that stabilized or had reduction in lesions after starting vaccination. That was also a correlation with the incorporation of what we identified as high quality new epitopes uh, not only taking into account their predicted immunogenicity, but also a lot of features that we learned were extremely important uh, in order to uh, select epitopes that we believe would provide clinical benefit if we were able to achieve an immune response towards those. So near VBNO2, this study uh, combination with a TESO uh, two doses, this is obviously a uh, safety. Uh, they're also looking into several biomarkers and tumor efficacy uh, uh, in combination up to 40 patients. As mentioned, these are locally advanced recurrent or metastatic solid tumors uh, tested broadly. Um, and we are um, then recruiting patients in US, Germany and Spain. So um, also a brief repetition of EB1016. Um, this is our off-the-shelf uh, therapeutic HPV vaccine, meaning we make one vaccine that can be applicable for multiple patients. Uh, we did finalize a phase 1-2A study with this, importantly as monotherapy, so we can really see what's induced purely by the vaccines. Uh, and that was performed in HPV16 precancerous cervical lesions. Um, in this study, we demonstrated the ability to induce um, vaccine-induced HPV-16 specific T cell responses. Um, and we did also here, uh, interestingly, see a strong correlation between the vaccine-induced T cell responses and the strength of these and the lesion size reduction in the patients. It was really a clear-cut uh, correlation in this first study. We also observed that we had a PDL1 upregulation in this study, uh, which was a monotherapy study, and that provided a nice scientific rationale for a combination of anti PD1 and anti PDL1, which is what we are currently doing in this phase two study, where we are testing VB1016 and ATESO in advanced cervical cancer um, late stage. Um, and we have. Um, announced in Q2 interim uh, safety analysis that support continuation of that study as expected, where it's always good, good to achieve and get past this analysis. Uh, and uh, our um, aim is to release then interim clinical data, um, which is now currently expected Q1 uh, 2022, slightly delayed. Um, we do uh, see uh, this as a very interesting product um, and it has applicability not only in cervical lesions or cervical cancer, but all HPV-16 positive cancer types. So we are um, working on expanding the scope to several uh, HPV 
risk-driven cancer types, including head and neck cancer uh, for this product. It is fully owned by Vaxibody, so there are no other rights to this. So um, this is CO2. Um, currently, uh, this is up to 50 patients, uh, recurrent non-resectable HPV-16 positive cervical cancer. These patients do not respond very well to checkpoint inhibitors as monotherapy, so it will be interesting to look into the data. Um, the trial is recruiting patients uh, in six different European countries. Um, and then uh, we will um, talk a bit more about our uh, um, platform uh, in infectious diseases. Um, we do see that the Vaxibody platform has several key advantages uh, that we could explore in infectious diseases in general. That what we see with this targeting technology, making sure that the antigens do get to the antigen presenting cells rapidly, we always see a very rapid onset of immunogenicity. And in many infectious diseases, this is important. Um, we have uh, this platform and we know that we can incorporate um, multiple different antigens into the same uh, vaccine technology. That gives us lots of opportunities on making differentiated products um, that can be applicable in the future, either within one disease or across different diseases in one, in one vaccine molecule. Uh, working with uh, the DNA plasmid format, that is the most attractive manufacturing formulation distribution and administration that we can think of, uh, which is important obviously for infectious diseases, cost of goods and distribution uh, globally. Uh, and uh, these targeting units that we are using, uh, we know we can change them. We know if we change the targeting unit, we will deliver the antigens to different subsets of these antigen presenting cells. And we know that that leads to different immune response profiles. And there are different immune response profiles that uh, are most important for protection for different infectious diseases. So we can explore that with our technology and intelligently select the optimal targeting unit uh, for antigens of a certain disease in order to make sure that we have the, the uh, optimal match uh, of the immune response profile induced per disease. It is also very well tolerated. Um, which uh, is important, especially moving into prophylactic vaccinations. So um, uh, currently we do have these two COVID-19 vaccines uh, in development. Um, interestingly, today we have the highest number of COVID-19 cases in Norway. Um, there are uh, more and more data uh, supporting that there is still going to be an unmet need for improved COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, as you know, we see these neutralizing antibodies induced by these marketed Wuhan-based vaccines. They do wane over time and they start at lower levels in the elderly, et cetera, uh, and they are further reduced efficacy against these um, variants of concern. And most significantly, as you can see here, uh, against the beta variant so far, uh, which includes a specific mutation. Uh, but we also see reductions against the delta variant that is currently dominating. Uh, so we have, uh, and we decided not to uh, push forward our Wuhan uh, candidate uh, uh, into the clinic, but um, make an updated version that includes these most uh, important or most significant mutations in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein that we see in beta um, in order to see um, uh, whether we can uh, enhance the antibody response to this strain and across the different variants. We do have preclinical data that really support the potential to offer both rapid, uh, strong and long lasting neutralizing antibody responses and importantly across multiple variants of concern. There is also an uh, increasing uh, evidence for the need for a T-cell focused COVID vaccine. Um, 
we see, uh, for instance, that uh, T cell responses in vaccinated human subjects coinc coincide with this early protection before we actually see antibody responses. Uh, there is a higher proportion of CD8 positive T cell responses in those patients that observe mild disease. Uh, and there is also, uh, interestingly, here you see a nice study, and uh, they use reduced cases um, associated with strong T cell responses. So if you see here, all patients in this study that actually had the strong uh, T cell response with Alispot high uh, did not get um, uh, COVID-19, uh, while those that had weak T cell responses are the ones that tested positive. These are also not sensitive to mutations in the current variants of concern, as you see here in the orange bars at the bottom compared to antibody responses. So um, in order to make the perfect uh, T-cell based vaccine, uh, it's important to select the T-cell epitopes that are immunogenic in patients with a different genetic background, different HLA molecules. Um, and that can induce a strong uh, T cell response, and particularly potentially those uh, T cell responses that are induced both across the patient population, but also that seem to be uh, highly upregulated in those patients that do not have the most severe disease. This is um, what uh, adaptive biotechnologies uh, can. Uh, provide. So they're sitting on a completely unique patient material where they screened um, T cell responses uh, in uh, thousands of patients with COVID-19 and identified exactly those uh, regions that can conduce the most clinically relevant T cell. So we are very happy to partner with Adaptive Biotechnologies uh, on that aspect, and they obviously want to partner with Vaxibody based on our ability to make sure that the epitopes that they do identify, that we actually uh, have a higher likelihood for those epitopes to induce a T-cell response after it's incorporated in our targeted Vaxibody technology. So we think this can be used both as a booster vaccine. This is not only from the spike protein. So these are really epitopes from across the entire SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS genome. Um, and that is also conserved regions. Uh, so this can be uh, used as a, a universal booster and will make sure that all patients hopefully have a strong T cell based uh, memory response. Uh, and long lasting. Obviously on the T cell side, if we can uh, confirm in the clinical studies that we also are able to achieve a rapid uh, T cell based immunity that can open up for using this also as a therapeutic. Because the mechanism of action of T cells is to get rid of the infected T um, cells specifically and rapid. So this is our two candidates, VB2129 and VB2210. Uh, they are identical in targeting dimerization unit, and then they are different in the antigenic unit. So uh, this um, one to the left then has the three mutations uh, in the receptor binding domain that we also find in the beta variant. Um, and the T cell candidate then has a string of the most interesting validated T cell epitopes identified by the unique material adaptive biotechnology. Uh, these are uh, what we find extremely encouraging data um, from the preclinical studies. This is neutralizing antibody responses achieved after one or two doses of our uh, VB2129. Uh, and tested against four different variants of concern. Uh, interesting, if you do look into any preclinical data from any of the competitors that are currently on the market, none of them have shown the ability to induce neutralizing antibodies after one dose. They need two doses in order to achieve neutralizing antibody titers that are detectable. This, um, is where one of the important things where we see we differentiate. So we see strong up to a thousand uh, here in titers with the low dose one microgram LVV2129 and still um, uh, with 
neutralizing ability higher than human convalescence therapy. Obviously, we see a stronger, uh, even stronger uh, uh, efficacy with two doses. Um, interestingly, this is against the South African variant, um, where the uh, Wuhan-based vaccines do not uh, show very good neutralizing activity. Um, and uh, that is much to our vaccine, but we also see very strong neutralizing activity against the other variants we have tested so far including Wuhan, this is the original variant, um, Alpha and Gamma, all above the convalescent control sera. And this is performed by Nexalis, which is the uh, CEPI uh, central lab. Um, so this is comparable to this uh, to other vaccines. As I mentioned, Adaptive, we are very happy to work with Adaptive. They are by far the partner of choice for uh, identification of T-cell epitopes that we can incorporate into our vaccine technology. Uh, they have applied a very unique platform to identify and validate these epitopes, uh, screening thousands of patients and identifying which T-cells are expanded the most in each patient how does that T cell receptor look like and how does that match back to the antigen? Uh, they have also interestingly developed this um, T detect uh, diagnostic tool for COVID, which is based on the same technology, measuring the T cell responses in each patient uh, to identify whether they have been exposed to COVID-19 and that has received emergency use authorization already. And uh, obviously this is something we can take advantage of much more than if we developed our own T cell epitope based vaccine uh, when it comes to immunomonitoring and, uh, and identifying the T cell responses in patients as well um, before and after vaccination, which can be an interesting tool for also providing uh, immunological evidence that can lead to um, um, approval of T cell based vaccines if the regulatory authorities uh, get in that um, same sentiment. Uh, the technology of adaptive is a bit difficult to explain uh, in detail, so I'm happy to take questions afterwards. But what they've done is that they have, they have actually a, a library of billions of T cell receptors in the repertoire. They're working. Uh, with Microsoft in order to have everything uh, incorporated. Uh, they have uh, a library here of more than 150,000 SARS-CoV-2 specific T cell receptor antigen pairs uh, across the entire genome and it's tested in hundreds of patients and you can identify which uh, parts of the antigen if you look below here uh, that are able to induce the strongest T cell responses, but also in the most in as many patients as possible. Uh, there are no one else that can do the same. We have also confirmed the, uh, these data by testing uh, the uh, responses uh, in also in the transgenic humanized HLA molecules where we can measure uh, those epitopes that they say this is supposed to bind this particular HLA molecule and induce a T cell response. We are able to confirm that they had a good selection of epitopes and also they could see that we had the technology that were able to trigger that immune response to the epitopes they selected which forms the basis for this partnership. And uh, so this is after a single vaccination and we see strong responses to the left here against those human epitopes that we tested. And this is only a subset of the ones we tested to one specific HLA. Um, interestingly, we also see when um, in wild type mice where we are not uh, optimizing uh, the T cell epitopes in order to induce mice specific uh, responses, we still see strong responses. It gives you some comfort as to ability to induce T cell responses across different um, HLA. Um, On SARS-CoV-2, as we have shown you before, this ability that I think is important for our partners, um, 
in order to select Vaxibody as their partner of choice is this uh, uh, ability to induce a broader T cell response. So also here in the receptor binding domain, we have data where we see from publications that these epitopes with a star below are the ones that are published to be immunogenic in this region, in this mouse model. Uh, however, uh, we are adding on for additional T cell epitopes and three of those are strong CD8 T cell responses and that confirms what we have seen before. So uh, this study um, that we are um, getting close to initiate uh, will um, be um, with both candidates in one study. Uh, the candidate one, which is the VB2129, uh, includes both naive and pre-vaccinated um, patients um, in, in dose escalation study, testing different doses, and then an expansion phase uh, where focused on the pre-vaccinated uh, based on, on this will be performed in Norway. Uh, and uh, the second candidate will um, then uh, be also performed in pre-vaccinated in a dose escalation as um, part, and then uh, we move the selected dose into an expansion phase. Uh, we've said we uh, aim to um, uh, vaccinate the first patient early Q4. So in infectious diseases in general, um, uh, in addition to what we see with COVID-19, this rapid onset of immune responses then has this potential for making vaccines with one dose pot uh, potential and also therapeutic efficacy. Uh, we can incorporate these multiple sets of antigen uh, which it has a potential for broader protection uh, and also uh, we could uh, explore pan pathogen vaccines. Um, this ability to tailor uh, the products to each disease and its correlated protection can create its unique vaccines and, and importantly our manufacturing process lends itself very well uh, for uh, broad um, applicability in a prophylactic setting. My last uh, point, I uh, wanted to mention uh, our research efforts that we've initiated within autoimmune disorders. Uh, there is a lot of things going on at the moment that it gives, um, that supports the potential of antigen specific immune tolerance for uh, treatment of uh, autoimmune disorders and potential also allergy, etc. And here, Having our core technology, um, we can explore exchanging this targeting unit uh, where we can uh, incorporate natural ligands as well as single chain FE molecules uh, that bind to um, certain subtypes of dendritic cells, making sure we do that in tolerogenic dendritic cells uh, and inducing regulatory T cells by um, providing the correct signal through the targeting unit. So that's all from me. Huddle, our CFO, is taking over for the, the numbers. Thank you, Agneta. So, uh, looking at the income statement, we reported the total revenues and other income of 1.9 million in the second quarter and 2.7 million in the first half of. 2021. If you look at the revenues from contract with customers, uh, this relates to the Genentech agreement <coughs> where we recorded 1.6 million in the first, second quarter and 2.1 million in the first half of 21 relating to R&D activities. Uh, under our IRPRS, uh, the initial contract value of the Genentech agreement was 245 million which relates to the initial upfront payment and near-term uh, payments, as well as the first milestone. <clears throat> the 245 million is then split in a license component of 215 million and a research component of 30 million. As you can see, the 250 million li license component was recognized in 2020. Well, the 30 million uh, research component will be uh, recognized over time based on the development of the activities. Our other income uh, relates to government grants from Skattefund and the Research Council of Norway. 
We have been ramping up the organization and also our research and development activities, which uh, explains the increase in employee benefit expenses and also other operating expenses in 2021. Uh, we don't have any debts, uh, so our uh, finance income and finance costs mainly relate to movements in foreign currency exchange rates and also fair value adjustments of financial instruments. So overall, we reported a net loss of 6.2 million for the second quarter and 12.8 million for the first half of 2021. Moving on to the balance sheet, we had a strong cash position of 174 million as per June 30th. I think it's also important to mention that we had money market funds of uh, 21 million uh, as per June 30th, giving total available liquidity of 195 million. If we look at trade receivables, uh, these are the amounts invoiced under the Genentech agreement, while contract assets are revenues earned but not invoiced under the agreement. Movement in contract assets uh, relate to uh, the performance of our obligations under the agreement, less than invoiced amounts, which are then moved to trade receivables. At year end uh, 2020, uh, contract assets were 15 million. Uh, during the first half, we had income of 2.1 million uh, in, uh, in revenue, which is then added to contract assets. And we invoiced seven and a half million uh, under the Genentech agreement, which is then deducted, giving 9.6 million in contract assets at the, as per quarter end. Uh, moving on to the final slide, uh, we had a total equity of 168.5 million uh, at the um, end of uh, the first half, representing a strong equity ratio of 79%. And with that, I will hand the word back to Michael, who will give an update on the organization. So just a, a few words on the uh, growth of, of the company with all the ideas uh, and aspirations that you sense from the team, in particular uh, the research team, you, you you can imagine we will need both hands and in particular brains in, in Vaxibody and we are growing. We have nearly tripled since 1st of January 2020 to uh, be around 86 uh, people in Vaxibody uh, at 15th and of August and continuing that, uh, that trajectory. Uh, those people uh, split, uh, the, the increase split evenly across the various departments. For simplicity, we just broke it into four different departments here, CMC, uh, medical and research, and then others. And you will notice that the research departments continue to constitute a significant part of our organization, underlining our commitment to make sure we stay ahead of the game as a technology platform company. Uh, news flow, near-term near news flow, we are looking at uh, providing updates on the VB1016 CO2 trial. We are on track to uh, finalize enrollment uh, in the second half of 2021. We also expect to enroll the first patient into the uh, COVID trial DL1. And as Aunida mentioned, we have uh, had to uh, delay the interim trial uh, slightly into uh, first quarter 2022. So to sum up, Vaxibody is a company based on a unique leading and proprietary vaccine platform with potential to uh, fuel future pipeline uh, across multiple diseases. We, our platform is validated through clinical data and collaboration with international partners of choice. We have a solid oncology pipeline addressing a broad range of tumor types as well as novel next generation COVID-19 vaccines. Key catalysts are expected within the next 12 months, and we are well capitalized to execute our growth strategy and maximize our value generation. And with those words, we will open up for questions, and I'll just invite Aunida and Harald up here together with me. So then I want to start to just remind those who are watching the stream that you can use the Q&A section by up in the right corner. 
Uh, but to begin with, uh, we will start with the questions from the room here, so that uh, the people online can uh, can implement, uh, can uh, punch in their questions. So, any questions here in the room? Um, regarding the COVID, uh, I think we'll just hand you a mic. So that uh, the people who are watching the stream also hear the question. COVID. <laughs> Regarding the COVID vaccine, uh, the product you are developing, um, provided that the data confirms that the product is is, is marketable, uh, could you, if you can't give us a timeline for when it will reach mark the market, could you elaborate on? what the other hurdles for reaching the market are and so so we get a grip on other so, sort of stumbling blocks or boosters except for the data which we're all of course waiting for and which you can't comment on more than you have already yeah i can i can start briefly so this is obviously a very dynamic field as you know a couple of months ago, uh, we were not expecting to have uh, this many cases that we see today. Uh, so that's also the case for the regulatory authorities. Uh, so there is, uh, for those of you following the field, a lot of uh, efforts going on in order to identify correlates of protection. So those first uh, vaccine studies really needed to do large scale phase three studies with a placebo control group in order to get sufficient efficacy data. Um, and then currently um, there's a lot of efforts going on in order to find the correlate of protection so you can identify that in a smaller patient uh, population that can give you uh, authorization based on immunogenicity parameters and not necessarily large-scale efficacy analysis so that is obviously going to be extremely important for the timelines for our particular our vb2129 if um, that uh, pans out and there will be a specific correlate of protection that we can uh, achieve based on uh, primarily immunogenicity and obviously safety um, that can speed up development of our vaccine products. So we're following that closely. Uh, for the T-cell based vaccines, that's obviously a novel uh, vaccine where we like to be uh, groundbreaking and, and with key partners. Um, so, so that's also lots of efforts going on. If you have seen the correlate of protection, there are data that support that there are neutralizing antibodies do correlate to a certain extent, but not necessarily explaining everything. And T-cells are obviously the primary suspect for being the other correlate of protection. And uh, here the advantage of working with adaptive biotechnologies that have this tool already, which has been approved by FDA for use as diagnostic that is measuring the T cell responses in each patient. And that is a tool that is used also for immune monitoring, also for the other studies they published as immune monitoring using that tool both from the AstraZeneca studies as well as uh, yeah. Moderna, et cetera. And uh, the generation of data uh, with a uh, validated tool that's already approved by FDA for uh, diagnostics uh, would uh, have the highest likelihood uh, of having a potential of also being used as a correlate of protection for T cell responses. So um, working with adaptive at least gives us the highest opportunity for speeding up development on T cell based vaccines on, on multiple arms. Okay, if there is there are no more questions from the room, we'll start for, okay. on the online questions. So uh, you touched upon this in the presentation, but uh, we have a question regarding does the platform allow uh, implementation of more than one antigen in the hybrid protein molecule? Yeah, so our, for instance, our VB1016, which was our first product, has two uh, large globular full-length proteins uh, in the antigenic unit. 
So that's uh, uh, an interesting uh, benchmark there. We have preclinical data, for instance, with the uh, tuberculosis vaccine that we've shown before, and that incorporates three large globular uh, antigens into the, the same vaccine. These can come from the same pathogen or same cancer uh, type, or they can also then span different variants or different pathogens, etc. Uh, and it is an important tool. I and mean, when we investigate our competitors in the competitive landscape, the ability to incorporate the large set of antigens or also a large set of T cell epitopes, uh, importantly, uh, we seem to have a technology that can uh, can tolerate or encompass uh, a larger set of antigens, which which will be interesting to start exploring in the future. And then we have a question. Uh, regarding the slight delay on the VBCO2 uh, study with VB1016, and if this uh, is due to uh, slower than anticipated enrollment due to the pandemic. Yeah, thanks, Lars. I, I think you answered the question yourself. This, this is uh, largely due to, to uh, the COVID pandemic situation across Europe finally catching up with us. Uh, and in some countries have been hit harder than than others. Uh, I think we're seeing a little bit of an issue down in southern Europe right now uh, on, on the Balkans. So um, fortunately, we've been able to get through 2021 with almost no impact. But, uh, but here we had to, to say, OK, we can stop later into the first quarter. And then we have a question uh, with regards to the variant of concern that are now, uh, as you saw, the Delta surge, as we have seen. Uh, and how does a vaccine for your RBD candidate that targets the beta variant, how, how is that relevant in a market where we see Delta surging and which might see new kinds of variants going forward? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so we are uh, hopefully soon getting uh, direct data uh, on the Delta variant um, in the studies. Uh, but what we see uh, across the four variants that we have tested, not only the one that is um, much specifically to the beta, but including both the Alpha and uh, the Wuhan variant, and Delta is somewhere in between. Um, and we see strong ability to neutralize those as well, higher than the human convalescence era, even after one dose. Uh, so uh, without having the data, we are very uh, positively confident that the, the data we will also see against Delta uh, will support uh, the data we have generated so far with the variants we've tested so far. Um, we believe this is due to the way uh, so one, what the mechanism of action with the way we display this and this APC B cell synapse that generates high affinity uh, antibodies rapidly and strongly, uh, but also the fact that uh, we are exposing epitopes um, across the entire surface of the receptor binding domain, and some of these are hidden uh, when uh, they are exposed in the other spike proteins. And those can be more conserved and may explain why we do see uh, a stronger uh, effect across the different variants. Um, interestingly, there are some data supporting that as well with llama antibodies. Molecular partners have these small molecules also binding three sites on, on the receptor binding domain. Uh, so there are data supporting that, that um, exposing different uh, uh, epitopes on receptor binding domain can help uh, create this cross protection across the variants. Uh, somebody asks here about the bandwidth with regards to moving forward uh, with new preclinical programs in the different disease area. I guess this is relating to when, if you are uh, um, launch new candidates, how long should could we expect them to be preclinical before moving into potentially clinical studies? That's a good question, and it, it's not a one answer fits fits all. But you do see our efforts in in increasing, uh, particularly, and making sure that the research departments uh, are uh, continuing to grow and and consist of, of approximately fifty percent of the organization. That is due uh, to the fact that we want to continue to develop groundbreaking new new uh, um, vaccines. So, so your your question relates to whether we want to incorporate like a standard antigen that everyone else is doing rapid timelines, keeping the same uh, 
uh, targeting unit, as we've seen, we've done with successfully so far with uh, with the COVID vaccines. Um, uh, we can skip multiple steps in uh, in the regulatory pathway, uh, but it will take longer if we want to do more size, uh, sophisticated antigen selection, uh, as well as uh, as uh, changing and optimizing, as I mentioned, with the targeting units potentially. So I think you will see. Um, it's sort of two different subsets uh, of uh, our strategy in the future. Some that we would like to push forward rapidly, uh, as well as continuing to create uh, novel and unique uh, products, not only based on the vaccine body format, but also on the antigen um, design. If, if I can just echo on, on that and uh, to some extent repeat last. For the second candidate, we took into clinic the DTN-Neo, and now the third candidate we're bringing into clinic with the vaccines, we do realize a significant benefit of being a platform company. So, so the authorities have really ascribed a lot of, of uh, credit for the data we generated with the first uh, vaccine. So if you compare us to a traditional vaccine uh, antibody company and so on, you'll see much faster progress through the early stage and pre-transition. And, and then we have an uh, interesting question here about what is the incidence of neutralizing anti-drug antibodies towards the non-antigen domain of the hybrid protein molecule? So will uh, will our bodies make, make uh, detect it as foreign and will it make antibodies against it? I think that's for me as well. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, so um, a good question uh, and and very important, uh, you know, negative factor for for many other drugs. So far, we haven't seen anything in that direction. Uh, so uh, what we know is that we really, when this targeting unit is functional, so we can have control molecules where we make sure that it's not binding to surface receptors, antigen presenting cells. When it's functional, it's really rapidly taken up. So we don't have the protein wandering around in circulation and being recognized by antibodies or anti-drug antibodies. Um, it is targeting antigen presenting cells rapidly. So we have so far no uh, evidence of any anti-drug antibodies or any anti-drug uh, immune responses towards the other compartments than the antigenic unit. We also continue to see that when we boost, uh, we see an increased uh, immune response, which we shouldn't see if we had neutralizing antibodies um, arising over time. So fortunately, we don't see that as, uh, as an issue. So then we maybe have a question for Hadal here. Um, cash flow has, uh, or, or uh, expenses uh, has increased uh, with increased R&D R &D efforts and the growing headcount. So what can you say about the development going forward? Uh, should we expect uh, cash flow to, to, or should we expect, expect expenses to continue to increase significantly going forward? I don't think there will be a, <clears throat> a significant increase in expenses. I mean, we are, of course, uh, ramping up the organization, as we say. Um, you know, some of it also uh, relates to social security costs on on the option program uh, you know, with a with a significant increase in share price we've seen but uh, <clears throat> you know we are we are well capitalized uh, we do have milestones coming in also so uh, but uh, you know I, I will not give any guidance on on the on the cash flow going forward also depends a lot on as Agnetta said, uh, you know, the, the process in the, in the different candidates we're looking at. And then I think we'll just take a final question here. So uh, I've got this question several times. Is the dual listing still something you are exploring? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's uh, yes, we are still in the process of exploring a US aspect of the listing. Correct. So I think that will conclude our Q&A session. Thanks, Mark.